Welcome, brothers and sisters in the faith, to another episode of Bible Question and Answer, a Bible study program brought to you by the Assembly of Yahushua. Our topic for today is about the message of our King Yahushua on the cross. Now, before we go ahead and proceed, let us first offer a prayer of thanksgiving. Everlasting Father, most holy and gracious Abba Yahuwah, thank you so much for the blessing that you have bestowed your people. Thank you for calling us into humble worship. Yahuwah Abba, we worship you in spirit and in truth because you have gifted us the opportunity to approach you in holiness through the shed blood of your beloved son. Yahushua, we will forever commemorate and remember your precious death and sacrifice on the cross. Be with us now in our studies so that we can learn how to properly honor your death and sacrifice. May you speak to us, O King Yahushua, in our hearts through faith, that we can be well established in faith to grow more and more like you. Father, please continue to bless all of us who worship you. Be with us today in our studies. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, praises be to our loving Father that we are able to again study his words and his commands. We know that our King Yahushua died on the cross. And this is the purpose for why we observe the Passover Supper. The supper that was established by our King Yahushua prior to his crucifixion. Now, we know that the importance of the death of our King Yahushua brought upon us redemption. And through redemption, we can now approach the Father to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so what can we learn from Yahushua's message from the cross? This is our topic for today. We know our King Yahushua from the very outset of his ministry, beginning with his synagogue teachings, he taught many things about many topics, and there are different discourses throughout the life and ministry of our King Yahushua. When we look at the book of Matthew, for example, we can see the different categories of the sermons of our King Yahushua, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount. This was basically the sermon from which our King Yahushua really became famous, the Sermon on the Mount. Then the commissioning teachings, this is about commissioning the disciples of our King Yahushua to expand the kingdom, to call many other disciples. And he taught about parables. We know our King Yahushua often used uh, parables in many of his teaching and his discourses. Next, we have the Ecclesia discourse. This is the teaching about becoming different from the world as members of his church or Ecclesia. And then, of course, we have the teaching about the end times uh, called the Olivet Discourse. So our King Yahushua had many teachings. He had many things to say. And every single word that came from the mouth of our King Yahushua is indeed significant for our benefit and for our edification. However, when we consider the different sermons of our King Yahushua, I believe among the most important would be the sermon that he delivered when he was on the cross. The reason why we say that is because when you are hung on the cross, as is depicted here, if you look at the highlighted part, when it comes to normal breathing, the exhalation is passive. But for one who is a crucified victim, his exhalation is active. In other words, every breath is painful and excruciating. Every breath is a struggle. This is why whatever words were spoken by our King Yahushua while on the cross, we know these are precious words, something that we need to heed. This is why we can call the statements of our King Yahushua even though they are sparse compared to his other teachings. Nonetheless, they are important because every breath that came out of his mouth must be precious because it came through excruciating pain. So we can call his sermon while nailed on the cross, the sermon on the cross. And so if we want to truly honor the death and suffering of our King Yahushua, yes, we partook of the supper, we ate the bread and drank from the cup. But if we truly want to honor the death and suffering of our King Yahushua, it is but right that we heed and follow the sermon that he delivered while on the cross. And so what did he say exactly 
while he was on the cross. We're going to get information from different gospel writers to put together all the different sayings of our King Yahusha. Turns out there's about seven sayings of our King Yahusha. All of them can be considered a sermon in and of itself. Well, so let's go ahead and take a look at the sayings of our King Yahusha while on the cross. Number one, in Luke 23, 34, then Yahusha said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So this was the first saying of our King Yahusha. What is saying number two? Luke 23, 43, and Yahusha said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is saying number two. Now we have saying number three. When Yahusha therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So that's saying number three, which we can find in the book of John, in the book of Mark. So we went from Luke, John, Mark. Remember, these different gospel writers, they give us information that may not be found in some of the other writings of the other gospel writers. So here, here's bro uh, brother Mark. Here's Mark in 1534. And at the ninth hour, Yahusha cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so that is saying number four. Next, we have saying number five, John 19, 28. After this, Yahusha, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And so he says, I thirst. That's saying number five. Now we have number six, Luke 23, 46. And when Yahusha had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So that's saying number six. And when he breathed his last, his last exhalation, uh, John 19, 30. So when Yahusha had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So that's saying number seven. So as you can see, the sermon on the cross is not very lengthy. However, when you take a close examination on the statements of our King Yahusha while on the cross, though not lengthy, they are powerful. And this is what we're going to study today. The seven sayings of Yahusha on the cross, which we can call the Sermon on the Cross. Let's look at the first one, Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And so we can see here the spirit of our king, Yahusha. He was nailed to the cross, yet he prays to the father and asked the father to forgive those who did this to him. How many of us can do that? Our king, Yahusha, was quick to forgive even those who crucified him and beat him all the way to the cross. And so because Yahusha taught this and said this, what does he expect from each one of us? Colossians 3 verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Yahusha forgave people. When he was on the cross, the first thing that came out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them. What does that tell us? It's important for our King Yahusha to follow his example, that we must be willing to forgive others, even those who, can, who are deemed unforgivable. This is why the Apostle Paul says, in applying that very first statement from our King Yahusha on the cross, he says, forgive anyone who offends you, because the Lord forgave you, you must also forgive others. So what if the person was the one who started it? Because oftentimes we're not willing to forgive if someone was the one who initiated a wrongdoing. Also, Peter chimes in and says in 1 Peter 3, 8 to 9, Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters. 
be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And he will grant you his blessing. What also must we do if someone does evil against us? If we are to follow our King Yahushua and we are truly called by him, we as followers of our king ought to be different from the way the world works. With the world, whenever someone does evil against them, what do they do? We repay evil with evil. This is why in the world, what happens to violence? It escalates. It does not stop. It gets worse and worse. There's a negative spiral of violence and hatred. However, for us followers of our King Yahusha, we say to ourselves, the evil stops with me. Because I choose not to retaliate evil with evil. Instead, I pay them back with a blessing. Just like our King Yahusha. What did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. What does it take for us to be able to do this? It needs love. This is why the Bible tells us we need to love each other as brothers and sisters. The Apostle John tells us because Yahuwah showed his love by giving up his son to die on the cross, we too must learn to love one another. But what kind of love must we practice? In Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, lest those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. What kind of love ought, to, ought we be practicing as sons and daughters of God through the shed blood of our king, Yahushua? We should practice True love, not worldly love. See, worldly love only loves those who love them. But those who are practicing true love, which comes from Yahuwah and Yahushua, they love even those who spitefully use them and even those who are his enemies. This is not something that's easy to do, right? This is something we need to grow into achieving. It's not automatic because of our human nature, because of our flesh. But this is what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is all about. We grow to becoming more and more like Yahushua. And so we become mature in the way we practice our life, including and especially the way we practice true love. We need to love even our enemies like Yahushua on the cross. And so how does true love work? What is one aspect of true love that comes from God and from Christ? Romans 5, 6 to 9, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us why? We were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. You see the love of God that he wants us to follow as an example. God loved even his enemies. He loved us while we were enemies. He loved us while we were sinners. He did not wait for us to approach him. He was the one who sent his son while we were still helpless and sinners. You know what that tells us about love? You see, one of the wonderful aspects about true godly love, true Christian love, is love initiates. Do you see that? Do you see how God initiates love? What did he do because of his love? He initiated the work of salvation. What did Christ do because of his love? He initiated the work of redemption. And so they did not wait for us to worship. No, they initiated it so that we can worship. That's true 
love. And so that's number one. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. It's about love. And we know love initiates the work of salvation. So the message of Luke 23, 34 is about love initiating the work of salvation. Let's take a look at the next one. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now, what is that all about? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the context. 39 to 43, then one of the criminals who were hanged uh, blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked, rebuked him, saying, do not, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Yahusha, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Yahushua said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When Yahushua was on the cross, there were also uh, others who were on the cross besides him. There were two criminals. Question, these two criminals, did they deserve salvation? <laughs> what do you think? All their life they grew up criminals probably, right? You don't know what their life was like, but we know that they did not deserve salvation. Truth is, none of us deserve salvation, especially if you're a criminal. A criminal who is being crucified. It shows and tells us they must have done something really bad. I mean, not every sentence, because you are a criminal, not every sentence is the sentence of the cross. But they were sentenced to the cross together with our king, Yahushua. The other one, blasphemed Yahushua. The other one defended our king, Yahushua. And said to Yahusha, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, this person on the cross, this thief on the cross, he believed that he was the Messiah because of his faith. What did our King Yahusha say? He said, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so he was guaranteed by Yahusha while on the cross, he was guaranteed salvation he didn't even have to do anything for his salvation right and so when you think about it wow that's a fortunate person <laughs> i mean he was about to die a terrible death but awaiting him is salvation salvation beloved brethren he's gonna get everlasting life just because he believed and had faith in our king yahusha what does this tell us about salvation Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so salvation is a gift. What prompts God to give this gift? What do you think? Why does he give us the gift of salvation? What is it about a person giving another person a gift? What moves him to do that? Does God have an ulterior motive for giving us salvation? No, there's only one reason why he's giving us salvation. Love, right? He loves us. Christ loves us. And so because of his love, he has given us the gift of salvation. So today, you will be with me in paradise. Promise to someone who did not deserve it tells us that love freely gives salvation by grace and Faith. And so it's the message of grace, the message of faith that we need to remember and incorporate in our life. Next, let's go to John 19, verse 26. Woman, behold thy son. And so what is this about? John 19, 26, 27. When Yahushua therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So here's a Yahushua. And on the cross, he speaks to the disciple whom Yahushua loves, who happens to be who? John, right? And he speaks also to his mother. What do we know about the mother of our king, Yahushua? He was a widow. He probably lost Joseph some time ago. So she was a widow. What do you know about widows? Especially back then. 
Today, it's tough to be a widow, more so during the days of the first century. It's difficult to be a widow because for if you're a widow, it means you're a woman, right? And back then, if you, you were a woman, you didn't have many rights. Unfortunately, that was the case. I mean, compared to what we have today, it's a good thing Christianity came along and kind of righted many of the wrongs and the atrocities that women faced during that culture, okay, because of Christianity. Nevertheless, if you were a woman, if you're an old woman, you were helpless. If you were a widow, you were even more helpless. And so what does Yahusha do? Yahusha endorses her mother to, uh, to be cared for by, by his son, right? And so he endorses his own mother to the care of Apostle John. And so what does this tell us about the will of our King Yahusha, about the will of Yahuwah Arba? In James 1.27, when God the, what God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion is this, to take care of orphans and widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. You know, when you think about people who are helpless, who are they? Widows and orphans. Pure religion, genuine religion takes on the form of helping those who are helpless just like orphans and widows. This was essentially the message of our King Yahusha on the cross. Take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. So when Yahusha says, woman, behold thy son, it communicates to us what is expected of us who are recipients of the redemption of our King Yahusha. As we receive love, we ought to practice love by helping those who are helpless, okay? So far, that's the picture of the message of our King Yahusha on the cross. It's about love. You notice the pattern, right? Let's go ahead and turn to number five before we go to number four. Let's go to the next one. I thirst. Who was the one who said, I thirst? Of course it is Yahusha. When he said, I thirst, what happened? Let's read John 19, 28, 29. After this, Yahusha, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put in hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And so when our king Yahusha said, I thirst, what was given to him? A sponge with sour wine and hyssop placed in his mouth. In actuality, this was to fulfill prophecy. This was to fulfill a prophecy found in the book of Psalms because Yahushua on the cross going through suffering, he's going to express thirst. He's going to express his suffering and need. Now, if you were a person alive, when Yahushua said, I thirst, what would you have done? If you are right there and you can see Yahusha on the cross and he says, I thirst, what would you do? What would you do? You'd give him something to drink, right? That's what I would do. Why? Because you love Yahusha. You see, if we love Yahusha and he, we see that he is in need, what do we do? We help. We give what Yahusha needs. And so Yahusha is telling us there are opportunities for us to provide what is needed by our king. How so? In Matthew 25, then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Here, our King Yahusha is commending those who will inherit the kingdom. What did he say to those who would inherit the kingdom? He said, I was hungry, and you gave me food, right? I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And they did all these wonderful things to our King Yahusha when he was in need. And so when Yahusha said this, what was the reply of his disciples? 37 to 40. 
Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in, pers or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Our King Yahushua is telling us, whatever you do to those who belong to me, even if they're the least of all the people, if they belong to me, whatever you do to them, you're doing to me. And so our King Yahushua is telling us, he's making the connection. If you want to help Yahusha, if you want to provide for him, right? If you, if you want to show him you love him, you can do that by helping those who are in need. And this is why in Hebrews 6, 10 to 12, Bible tells us about the importance of loving people and helping them in their time of need. For God is not unjust. You will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is that you keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Here the Apostle Paul confirms that when we help other believers by caring for them, we not only prevent ourselves from becoming spiritually dull, but also we will inherit the, the promises of God. Now, the believers of our King Yahushua, who are they? Those who belong to him, the, the ecclesia. So when we help each other in the ecclesia, who are we helping? Our King Yahushua. This is why when we have a believer who thirsts and we give him drink, we also give drink to our King Yahushua when he thirsts. And so Yahushua is connecting himself. He's ident identifying himself with us so that what we do with other believers, we do essentially to him. This is why we should not mistreat other believers. It's that we should love other believers because they are identifying with the one who is our head, our King, Yahusha. And Apostle Paul even says, James, Peter, and John, we all agreed, James, Peter, and John will be the apostle to the, to the Jews, and Apostle Paul will be the apostle to the Gentiles, but they had one thing in common. They were going to help the poor, right? That's what they wanted to do. And what also, what kind of help must we provide those who belong to the ecclesia? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jehusha Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so when we help each other by giving food or thirst or giving counsel and comfort during tribulation, we do so in commemoration of our King Yahuwah, our King Yahusha, and our father, Yahuwah. So when our Yahusha said, I thirst, it's an invitation. It's an invitation for us to help those who are in need. So love helps the poor and the needy. What else? Luke 23, 46. Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Now, what does that mean? I mean, just write off the statement. When you give to the hands of the Father, your spirit. What is that called when you entrust yourself? Surrender, right? Surrender, trust. Those two are synonymous when we commend uh, to the Father, our spirit, our future. That is trust. It's not easy to trust. I mean, the only time we are required to trust is when something's not working according to our ability to understand, right? Because if we can understand everything, we don't need trust. We know exactly where we're going. But if you don't know exactly where you're going and you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, then what do you need? Trust, right? There are times in our life when we're going to be in darkness. 
when we will experience the uncertainties of life, something happens in the present, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so what are we called to do? We need to trust. And Yahushua said on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so how did our King Yahushua show this kind of surrender, this kind of trust, even before he was sent to the cross in Gethsemane? Do you still remember what he prayed? Remember what he prayed in Gethsemane? Right? Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Yahushua, knowing that he would become sin for us, presented himself to the Father and asked if it's possible. Right? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will, your will be done. That's the prayer of surrender. That's the prayer of trust. We need to pray that prayer as well in times of our most difficult situations. Because in most difficult situations, we want God to remove the problem. But sometimes God says you have to go through the problem. And so that's what we need to trust. And when we go through tribulation in life, there's something we learn. What do we learn? In the book of Philippians 2, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he, referring to who? Yahusha, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Our King Yahusha, he was obedient all the way to the point of death. What kind of death? Death of the cross. You see, not everyone can be obedient. There are people who are obedient, but there's a limitation to their obedience, right? Because when it's when it comes for them to have to make a sacrifice to be able to obey, then they stop obeying. Yahushua sacrificed everything. He gave up his life to die on the cross just to obey God. That's the obedience of Yahushua. It is sacrificial obedience. It is the obedience of total surrender to trust in Yahuwah. It's something that caused him to learn obedience. Because in Hebrews 5, 8 to 10, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Apostle Paul tells us, that the son or king who shall learn obedience from what he suffered. You know what he learned? You know why Apostle Paul said he learned obedience from what he suffered? You know what our king who shall learn? He learned the reason why he's able to obey the father. It's because of his love for the father. You see, we will learn how much we love the father through our obedience. Because when we truly love someone, we're going to sacrifice for that someone. Right, You can tell how much you love a person by what you're willing to give up for the sake of that person. Right, That's what you learn. Oh, I, I, I learned that I, I, don't really, I don't really love you that much because I'm not willing to do that for you. But when you realize, you know what, I'm willing to give up my life for you, I must love you that much. Beloved brethren, when we go through difficult times, it's an opportunity for us to learn just how much we love God. How much do you love God? How much do you love Christ? How much do you love Yahuwah? How much do you love Yahusha? Do you, do you love Yahuwah and Yahusha enough that you are willing to entrust them everything, to trust them in obedience because you love them? That's the question of questions. How much do we love the Father? How much do we love the Son? Because sometimes we're only willing to obey if it's to our advantage, right? And so the Apostle Paul tells us we have to go through suffering because when we go through suffering, something happens to our character. What is that? Romans. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who has, who was given to us. So have you ever noticed when we were called into fellowship with Christ, we became the sons and daughters of God. But as sons and daughters of God here on earth, God doesn't remove the problems. 
God doesn't remove us from the sorrows, that he takes us through the sorrows of life. Why do you suppose that is? I mean, we're sons and daughters of God. Why do we have to go through these sorrows, these tribulations in our life? That's because he doesn't want us to remain as we are. Remember, because of his love, he initiated the work of salvation, even though we were still enemies. But it doesn't mean Yahuwah wants us to remain as we are. He wants us to grow. How can we grow? Through suffering. How can we grow? Through tribulation. What must we do? Through tribulation. Persevere. Because when we persevere, something happens to our character. It becomes stronger. What character does Yahuwah want to see in us? Love. Love. When we reach that point of perfect love, when we will obey Yahuwah and Yahushua, because we realize we love them. We love them. Beloved brethren, the next time we go through something difficult, something that we cannot explain, let's ask ourselves, how much do I really love Yahuwah? How much do I really love Yahushua? If we still truly love them, then true love will cause us to trust. It will cause us to say, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. I trust you. I love you. I will give you everything I have. I will give you myself. That's what our King Yahushua did. So love trusts even in the most difficult of situations in our life. And so Yahushua, he committed his life to Christ. And then he cries out, 1930, it is finished. In Luke 23, 46, and when Yahushua had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When you breathe your last, you take an inhale, and then you exhale. It's your last breath, right? When he exhaled, what did he say? So when Yahushua had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And then bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And so the last word from the lips of our King Yahushua was what? It is finished. It is finished. Finished. The word finished is the word tetelestai. So what does that mean? It's basically receipts. You see, sin is, is like a wage. When you commit sin, you have to pay for that sin, right? And so when a person keeps committing sin, he keeps getting billed. So you have a lot of receipts. Such you owe a lot of money. You have to pay all these charges against you because of your sin. But Yahushua said it is finished. What does that mean? It is finished. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And so on the cross, he cried out tetelestai because he nailed it to the cross with him. The record of the charges against us because of our sins. Our sins in the past, our sins in the future, they are on the cross. It was nailed on the cross so that we can have perfect redemption. How perfect is this redemption? Now, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He then would have had to suffer, often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away by the sacrifice of himself. And so our King Yahushua, when he was nailed on the cross, by his shed blood on the cross, our debts have been canceled, our sins have been forgiven, and we obtain eternal redemption. And because of this eternal redemption, do you know what Yahuwah and Yahushua is doing in heaven right now? Do you know what they're doing? They're carrying out the work of restoration in our life. Because they're going to finish that work of salvation. The work of redemption was finished on the cross. But the salvation work is ongoing. The restoration work is ongoing. But one thing we can know for sure, Yahusha, Yahuwah, they will finish it. Yahusha says it is finished. This is to tell us love finishes the work of salvation. And so these are the seven sayings of Yahusha on the cross. It's like the sermon 
on the cross, right? And so how can we heed? How can we honor our King Yahushua? After giving these seven statements on the cross, let's heed them and follow them. What does that mean? I mean, if we truly want to honor our King Yahushua, the seven sayings ought to be our life, right? These seven principles ought to be our life. These are like seven principles to live by. Many years ago, there was a popular book that came out, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, something like that. Remember that? It was a popular book. Many people bought the book, and it is a highly acclaimed book. These are the seven principles from our King Yahushua, which we ought to be practicing, right? What is? What are they? Love initiates. Beloved brethren, let's initiate love. If we know somebody's in need, let's not wait for them to approach us. We take the initiative to help those who are in need. Love freely gives. Um, love welcomes all with open arms, even if they don't deserve. Love helps those who are helpless. I mean, you don't help someone because you're thinking, how can this person help me in the end? When you're helping someone just because you're expecting something in return, that's not love. That's not love. Right? And then love helps the poor and the needy. If God has blessed us, then we need to also extend that blessing to those who haven't received the same, the same blessing that you have. Love trusts even in the most difficult situation. Love finishes what they start. And so we don't give up. We belong to the Ecclesia and the Assembly of Yahushua. We follow God. We follow Yahushua. We are on this journey to salvation. There are times we're going to stumble and fall. There are times when we're going to feel like quitting. But if we truly have love, we're not going to quit. We're going to finish. We're going to finish what we aim to do what we want to do. And so love finishes what it starts. You notice the chiastic pattern in these seven statements of our King Yahushua? Notice the pattern, right? I mean, look at number seven and number one. They're related. And number one, love initiates the work of salvation, but not only that. Love also finishes the work of salvation. Do you see how it kind of matches Two and six, love freely gives salvation by grace and faith. Love trusts even in the most difficult situations. And so in those most difficult situations, all the more we can expect to receive grace. Just like what Apostle Paul said. Remember when he had those, the thorn on his side? He prayed three times. Remember? He prayed three times. May you remove this thorn from my side. And Yahushua said, nope. <laughs> But I'll give you my grace instead. I'll give you my power instead. Because in your weakness, you can feel my power even greater. Right? So they go together. Two and six. And three and five. Love helps those who are helpless. Love helps the poor and needy. And so we who are able ought to give those who are not able. Okay? And so that's like the chiastic structure of our life in Yahushua. And when we look at this pattern... Something jumps at you. It's all about what? Love. Right? The message of our King Yahushua on the cross is to give love as often as we can. That's the message of our King Yahushua. But as human beings, sometimes it's hard to keep giving love. Right? Sometimes, especially during deep sorrows in life, you feel spent. You feel exhausted. And even in the helping profession, for example, people who work in social service or in mental counseling, a therapist is required to take vacation, take time off, not to work too much. They can't work certain, they can't go over 40 hours or certain amount of time because they'll burn out. <laughs> they'll experience helping fatigue because there's only so much that we can do to give. We're called to give love. That's the message of Yahushua on the cross. It's about love. Giving love. Practicing love. Being love. That's the message of the, message of the cross. But when you keep giving love, sometimes you feel, you feel exhausted. And you say to yourself, I can't give no more. Right? This is why we need to ask ourselves, how 
How can we keep giving love when we feel exhausted, when we feel sorrow, when we feel overwhelmed by the problems of life? What do you think the answer is? Do you notice in the seven that we discussed, there's one we haven't yet discussed? The one in the middle. Remember, in the chiastic structure, the one in the middle is the most important part, right? That's the most important part, the chiastic structure in the middle. And the middle says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When our King Yahushua cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you know what he was expressing? What is that? What When someone says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Have you felt something like that before? Have you said something of this nature before? Yahushua said that on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? What was he feeling? Why did he say that? He was feeling deep sorrow. Right? He felt deep sorrow. All of us are going to feel deep sorrow. And when you feel deep sorrow, it's very hard to give love. <laughs> what do you need the most when you're in deep sorrow? What do you need the most? You need to be loved. You need to receive love. Right? And so this is the wonderful message of King Yusha on the cross. When he felt deep sorrow, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He expressed his sorrow, but also, also, when Yahushua was on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know why he said that? Do you know why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he wanted the people there. He wanted the people to turn to the book of Psalm 22 in the verses 1. You see, back then, there were no books what did they have instead? Scrolls. They had no numbering in those scrolls like we have it today. There's no Psalm 22, verse 1. There's nothing like that. And so Yahushua and the people, when they wanted to reference a particular scroll, you know what they would do? They would quote the first verse because there's no numbering system. And so how would people know which scroll to look into? Well, somebody will quote the first verse. Yahushua, when he was expressing sorrow, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To express his own deep sorrow. Also, to tell us what he will do about deep sorrow. This is really where the powerful stuff happens. You see, when Yahushua was experiencing that sorrow, at the same time, he's pointing, he's pointing to prophecy. He says, turn, turn to that passage which says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it's going to be fulfilled. And so when we turn to Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And this is what our King Yahushua felt because he was going to be made sin for us. And so he's telling us, in your deep sorrow, I have deep sorrow. And he's fulfilling a prophecy. And that's Psalm 22, verse 1. But Psalm 22, verse 1 is just the beginning. When you turn to verse 6, this is what Yahushua says. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Our King Yahushua says, I am a worm. And that word worm, when he said, I am a worm and no man, or reproach of men despised by the people, that's prophetic. He's teaching us what he's going to do when he said, I'm a worm. The word worm, when you look at it in the Hebrew, what word is that? I know you know the, I know you know the word. Yep, it's the word tola, Hebrew word H8438. What is tola? It is a scarlet worm, scarlet stuff, crimson. 
the dye made from the dried body of the female of the worm, Pocuus illicis. Yahusha was likening himself to a worm. And also he was telling us that he is going to, to turn what is scarlet and crimson into something as white as snow to fulfill Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahuwah, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They are red like tola, they shall be as wool. And so on the cross, when Yahusha cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt the pain. He felt the actual pain of being forsaken by God because he was to be made sin for us. And so when he experienced separation from God, it was a pain so horrible. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's because he was experiencing the crimson of sin. He was exper experiencing the deep sorrow of sin. But what would he do with that sin? He would turn it white as snow. And so what our King Yahushua is telling us on the cross, that deep sorrow, he's going to turn it white. The crimson, he's going to turn it white. How so? Isaiah 53, surely he kept, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds. We are healed. And so our King Yahusha on the cross, the beating he took, the redemp the, uh, the shed blood that came from his body from head to toe, all that had a purpose. All that was to turn our sins from crimson red to becoming white as snow so that we can receive salvation. So that we can so that we can be made right in God's sight by the blood of the Lamb. You see, beloved brethren, that deep sorrow that sometimes overwhelms us was felt by our King Yahushua. And at the same time, that felt deep sorrow, it was solved on the cross because of the sacrifice of our Father, the sacrifice of our King. And so, beloved brethren, when we ask ourselves, how can we keep giving love? How? Remember the deep sorrow of our King Yahushua. Remember the sacrifice of the Father when he gave up his son. Remember the sacrifice of the son when he gave up himself. You see, that cross that represented the most cruel instrument of evil, Yahushua, through his sacrificial love, was able to turn it into glorious joy. We ask ourselves, how can we keep giving love? The answer is by receiving love. Sometimes we're so good at giving love, but we're not really good at receiving love. Beloved brethren, we need to feed off the love of Yahuwah. We need to feed off the love of Yahushua, especially in times of deepest sorrow. Because when we feed from the love of Yahuwah, when we feed from the love of our King Yahushua, we're also able to give more love. And when we keep doing that, we experience glorious joy. And this glorious joy is the message of the cross. The message of the cross of our King Yahushua is the message of sacrificial love that brings forth joy, unspeakable. This is why the Apostle Paul tells us, since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us? Whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Justification. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Yahushua died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Beloved brethren, if we feel overwhelmed, let's remember 
God did not spare his own son. He's willing to help us, to give us everything else. This is why let us be freely receiving the grace and the love of Yahuwah and Yahusha. Do not let the pain of life snuff out that joy that comes from the sacrificial love of the Father. Because sometimes as human beings, when bad things begin to happen to us, when troubles begin to attack us, when bad news comes like a scream one after the other, when this happens to us, beloved brethren, oftentimes we ask ourselves very difficult questions. And this is nothing new. Apostle Paul and the disciples, they ask those difficult questions as well. In Romans 8, 35, 37, take, take a look at this question that they ask. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or, or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for you, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. This was the experience of the early Christians, Apostle Paul included. They followed Yahushua. They pledged loyalty to Yahushua. They followed our King Yahushua. They received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. They were the sons and daughters of God. But you notice what they experienced as well. Trouble, calamity, persecution, hunger. They were destitute. They were in danger. Threatened with death. Many of them were killed. This is why they asked the question, does it mean then? Because we're, we're experiencing all of this trouble. Does it mean? Does it mean? He no longer loves us. That was the question they asked. How can this be happening to us? Does it mean Yahushua no longer loves us? And Apostle Paul was quick to answer. Verse 37, when this question was asked, he answered in verse 37, no. What's the answer, brethren? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. We often ask this question, and the answer is, even today, the answer is no. You may, you may have trouble, calamity. You may go through hardships, persecution. You may go through sickness. But it does not mean Yahushua no longer loves you. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. You see on the cross, there was transformation that took place. The cross was transformed from the most cruel instrument of evil to an instrument of love and joy. Sacrificial love of Yahuwah and Yahushua can turn our deepest sorrows into most glorious joy. And this is why if we are to answer the question for our BQA today, what was Yahushua's message from the cross? Simply stated, here it is. Yahuwah and Yahushua loves you. That's the message of the cross. Next time you see the cross, be reminded of the love of Yahuwah and the love of Yahushua. Has anyone loved you so much they're willing to give up everything for you? Remember what we said earlier? You begin to learn how much you really love a person when you are called upon to sacrifice for that person. If you're not willing to sacrifice for that person, it only means you only love him that much. But if you're willing to give up all, you love him that much. Yahuwah gave up his son, his only beloved son, for us. Yahuwah loves you that much, brethren. Yahushua endured the cross. Yahushua loves you that much. Has anyone loved you that way before? Can your parents love you that way? Can your brothers and sisters love you that way? Nobody can outlove the Father. Nobody can outlove the Son. Brethren, if we're going to look at the cross, and if we are to ask, what is the message of the cross? Yahuwah and Yahushua loves you. 
That's the message of the cross. But there's also another part to that message. Yes, Yahuwah loves you. Yes, Yahushua loves you. But let that love of Yahuwah and Yahushua flow through you. In other words, keep giving love while you keep receiving love from the Father. You receive that love from the Father and from the Son so that you can give that love to those who are in need. Let the love flow from heaven to you and to others. Let the love flow from the hand of Abba and his son to us. Let we be instruments of love towards others. This is why our King Yahushua, when he spoke to his disciples, said, I'm going to give you a new command. And this is the final passage of our studies. And essentially, this is the message of the cross. This is why Yahushua says this is a new command. This is the message of the cross. So now I'm giving you a new command. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Yahushua says this is a new command. Love each other. When you think of it, is that really a new command? Isn't that a command in the Old Testament? Yes. Why did Yahushua say it's a new command? Because he said, love each other just as I have loved you. That's the message of the cross. Love each other as I loved you. By doing so, you become my disciples. You see, when we receive the love of Yahuwah and Yahushua and we give that love to others, then we become disciples. That's what a disciple of Yahushua is. A receiver and giver of the love of Yahuwah through Yahushua. That's what it means to be a disciple. A transmitter of the love of Abba and his son to the world. This is why we proclaim the name Yahuwah. We proclaim the name Yahushua because we want to bring the love of Abba and Yahushua in our home and unto the world. This is our work. If we truly want to honor the death and sacrifice of our King Yahushua, love each other just as he has loved us. Let us stand and we shall pray together. Most holy and everlasting Father in heaven, Yahuwah Abba, you are the source of unfailing love. Your love covers our weaknesses. For while we were sinners, you initiated the work of redemption and gave up your son willingly. Thank you, Father, for that love. We will never forget what you have done. We can only expect and we can only hope that soon we will see you face to face when we dwell in your heavenly homeland. This is what we prepare for. This is what gives us joy because we know in that place, at last we will see you and we will experience being with you forevermore. Father, please help us to receive your love and the joy that comes from your love especially when we experience deep sorrows in life. May you transform them into an experience of glorious joy as we wait for the return of your beloved son, Yahushua, our king. You were nailed to the cross. You experienced death because of us. You love us that much. How can we ever repay you? King Yahushua, may we be your disciples. Help us to follow your good example. May we receive your love and give it to love each other the same way you loved us. Strengthen us. Teach us to become mature. Help us to grow more and more to practice what you have taught us to become your true disciples. Father, thank you for blessing us today. Continue to help us as we prepare for the great day of our salvation. Heal those who were sick among your people. Bless us, Father, with more faith and more ability to love. We ask everything loving Abba in the name of our King 
and our Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, beloved brethren, thank you so much for attending our Bible study for today. Let's not forget, this coming uh, Saturday, we have our last day convocation, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Also, we have First Fruits uh, the day after, which is on a Sunday, March 31st at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time to conclude our spring feast for 2024. And lastly, uh, take note, April the 1st is the deadline to register for our Alaskan cruise. And so we do hope many of you will be able to participate. I mean, you can already an anticipate how fun this would be and how edifying it would also be when we fellowship together, we who are like-minded and have faith in our King Yahusha and our Father Yahua, and learn how to experience the awe of our Father as we study the Word together, talk about Yahusha together, for edifying our faith. We do hope that many of you can participate. It's a seven-day um, cruise, and it's from October the 6th to October the 13th. If you are interested uh, please do contact the information, uh, the phone number given. This is the flyer that we have posted on Facebook. That is all. May Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha HaMashiach bless all of us.